dog may lessen just not bothering to plan? That's a question for teflologists. When I read this book, it's better to skim or scan. That's a question for teflologists. Can you be a good teacher if you have a Celta, or should you invest in an MA or a Delta? From politics to methodology, we'll discuss them all on Teflology. Hi, I'm Matthew. I'm Rob. And I'm Matt. And welcome back to the Teflology Podcast, a podcast all about teaching English as a foreign language and related matters, presented by three self-certified Teflologists. Tefl Cultures. Today's Tefl Culture is CMC. Do you guys know what CMC stands for? C- Computer Mediated Communication? Conversation? Oh, nice. Communication. Computer Medi- Mediated Communication. Okay. Yeah, you just know like she printed off my notes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't look at it. But, yeah. uh, so what is computer-mediated communication? What do you think? Uh, it's communication that... Uh, mediated. Uses as a medium some kind of computer device. <laughs> yep. Can you give me some examples of that? Email? Uh-huh. Messaging? Yeah. Skype? Mm-hmm. Yep, those are the, <laughs> the main they, forms. And they fall this into This is not two, an ad. No, they fall into the asynchronous and synchronous okay, communication. Yes, yeah, is that yeah, what yeah. they yeah. kind of... So, for example, asynchronous <laughs> is happening live. Yeah, so something like, like Skype or instant messaging. Asynchronous yeah, different times. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. emails, for example, or bl- yeah. blog or something. I get, there is a grey area, though, isn't there? Like mm. mes- messaging where, you know... Mm. And that's what uh, we're oh. going to be talking oh, about yeah, today. Right. Um, so, yeah, so you've got the, the kind of the face-to-face uh, computer-mediated communication, like Skype or FaceTime, that mm-hmm. kind of thing. You've got email, which is staggered over a long period of time. And you've got, in the middle, instant messaging, okay? Right. Like a Facebook messenger or Line or uh-huh. something like that. Okay, um, now <clears throat> computer mediated communication is studied through um, a technique called computer mediated discourse analysis or CMDA, which yeah. sounds like an illegal substance, yeah. but it's not, <laughs> it's less interesting. Um, and this, was, uh, this term was invented by Susan Herring, mm-hmm. um, who's the editor, I think, of the Journal of Computer Mediated Communication. She says that in instant messaging, there are a few threats to interactional coherence. So how easy it is to understand mm. the uh, interaction. Yeah. Um, it, the, well, the, the easiness of understanding the interaction is diminished by certain features of the messaging system. Yeah. Uh, and the two examples she gives from a 1999 article <coughs> are lack of simultaneous feedback yeah. caused by reduced audiovisual cues and the fact that messages can't overlap. Right. So you can't speak at exactly the same time as someone else. The yeah, messages yeah. are always going to appear yeah, yeah. in an order as dictated by the software. Yeah. And disrupted turn adjacency, um, which is caused by the fact that messages are posted in the order, as I said, received by the system yeah, yeah. without regard for what they're responding to. Yeah. Okay. So uh, in order to give an example of this, I've taken um, a bit from a messaging conversation I had several years ago, uh-huh. um, Okay, which uh, I have permission to use. This okay. is fine. Um, and... I want you guys to try reading through um, and try to read it verbatim, okay? Okay. Um, So we've got James and Steve. These are the pseudonyms I chose. One of them's me, so if you can guess. I'll be Um, James. Okay. (laughs) Okay, I'm Steve then, I guess. All right. Um, If there's any spelling mistakes, try to read them as they are because that's uh, funnier, isn't it? (laughs) Okay. Okay. That's that's something to read out? Or what what are these numbers? The the, the numbers are the times that it was received, so you don't need to read those. Okay. Okay. All right. Hey up, how's it going? Slowly. <laughs> I had a teaching nine classes a week. What it means doing three in one day. Boo! <laughs> How long are the classes? How's you? 90 minutes. I do 12 a week. I'm okay, a bit knackered. I did a Japanese class the morning and it was terrible. I couldn't focus or remember any vocab. Full stop. Hmm. Too much input. I'm falling behind with Japanese already. Ha <laughs> ha! Surprise. Are you having classes? 12 a week. You're a newbie. So you should. Semicolon P. <laughs> study at home with, come on, <coughs> semicolon capital D. Cool okay. Song. So. <laughs> 
<laughs> did that did that make sense to you guys? <laughs> well, so no, it's, it's we really, were what, yeah, 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 yeah we, we were talking we had two we were talking about cla- our, 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 our work. own class. We're talking about our work and our Japanese studies. Japanese and then yeah. also how we are. That kind of went on for a bit. Mm. Mm-hmm. Knackered. <laughs> Knackered. That kind of Yeah, I think there was a bit of delay where somebody asked somebody asked how's it going? And then mm. they just kind of put it all into one one um, reply. Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah. So this is um, the point of the disrupted turn adjacency that I mentioned before. Yeah. Um, so here, the, the conversation actually splits into three separate streams at certain points here, mm-hmm. where they're, they're discussing three separate things. They are discussing three separate things at the same time, because the messages are arriving after a previous message initiating a new topic had been sent. Yeah. So they're replying to that, and then replying to the previous message, and then, you know, sometimes they initiate something else, and it just carries on like that. Mm-hmm. So this is just an example that uh, I wanted to show you um, of some of the problems for uh, computer-mediated communication, for text-based computer-mediated communication, mm. instant messaging. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, what do you think people normally do to uh, kind of repair those issues? Repair or avoid? Well... I mean, you guys are experienced users of uh, instant messaging, I assume. Yeah, I'm not very, I'm not very experienced because I'm not very good at it. Okay. I do it maybe once a week, and I don't. It's not my favorite medium, to be honest. All right. Well, why is that? I, for that main purpose. Mm. Um, well, I, also because it is in that gray area between syn- synchronous and asynchronous. Mm. Right. So I kind of feel like I kind of feel like I'm writing an email, but mm. I'm not. But I also feel like if I send a message, I should be able to, you know, go away and get a glass of water and come back. Right. And then I kind of feel the pressure to respond as soon as you get one. Mm. Uh, also, a yeah. new thing now, this is quite a recent <coughs> thing, you, uh, a little face pops up on Facebook in particular. Other SNS is available, I yeah. should just say that. Um, where you can actually see if the person's read right, it or right. not. So yeah. that, kind, ah, of, that right. kind of leads to, okay, well, they've seen the message. They could reply yeah. there and then, but they don't. Yeah. So that kind of leads to another bit of yeah, trepidation. Yeah. Of right, right. Know. And also, you don't know how the messages are going to be received all the time, so you end up putting lots of exclamation marks <laughs> yeah. or, you know, whatever. And, al- and also that thing of, I, I remember when I first started doing it, I wasn't, I felt like I had to end everything with a question. Mm. It felt like it always has to be a back and forth. Right, right. Like, right. You, when you finish saying something, you have to you know, leave an opening for the other person to say something. Right. Um, and sometimes you think, am I, you know, is it clear enough that, you know, have I given them the chance to say something? Basically? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, so there, there are a lot of issues here. Um, I think what we can see in the extracts that we looked at um, are two, two things. So first, the fact that the messages are coming in at the time as dictated by the system um, would cause problems. If this was a face-to-face conversation and you were constantly initiating turns before the person's had a chance to respond to what you'd already said, mm-hmm. you wouldn't be able to do that. But in this case, you can refer back to the messages in the window, the previous yeah. messages, and you can continue several conversational streams, yeah. even though it's difficult, even though it's a bit confusing. It yeah. can be done. Um, but also, uh, you were saying colon, lowercase p, colon, capital D. What's that? What, what's the person doing there? Well, they're trying to show kind of non-verbal, um, what's the word? Communication. Communication, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. 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 There, there features, are features, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're trying to show that they're shouting or they're happy. They're trying to show emotion. Exactly. They're trying to... Um, <coughs> yeah, or irony or sarcasm. Yep. Or, yeah, yeah they're, they're trying to, to convey the intent of the message <coughs> through something that's not, mm-hmm. that's not purely text. You know. I remember when, when uh, the... You know, when it was clear that, I guess through, you know, early SMS messages and those kind of things, when it was clear that a lot of our communication would be written, mm. um, but very informal, like this kind of thing, mm. there was an attempt to come up with a um, new punctuation, right. a, a punctuation mark to, um, con- or to make it clear that the proceeding was sarcastic. Right, right, right. And I think, I'm sure you can find them online somewhere, They're like little squiggly things. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But that kind of thing doesn't, it, like, linguistic impositions never yeah. really catch on. Right. Yeah. yeah. Except for the that uh, those um, emoji keyboards. Oh yeah. Right. Okay. Fair enough. Mm-hmm. But I mean, <laughs> they still evolve naturally. But yeah. 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 Um, the other thing that the participants in that uh, conversation did was um, they had these little kind of phonetic approximations of sounds like pff and he he and ha uh-huh. and so on. So that's another way that they can kind of signal that's meant to be a joke or here yeah, I'm yeah, feeling yeah, exasperated. Yeah. You know, there are a few different things there. Um, so. 
this you were saying that it's very difficult for you um, mm. to engage in this kind of interaction. Mm. Yeah. I think that there are lots of problems with this kind of interaction. What kind of issues do you think it would present for second language learners mm. who are engaging in that kind of IM, instant messaging communication? Mm. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, they. I think that they should be um, encouraged to engage in that kind of like communication because, mm. like these days, English is not just about speaking to your teacher and also your teacher is not the only bringer of English are they as well yeah, yeah. so they do need to use English to communicate mm. like on that kind of platform um, yeah I mean that does throw up loads of other teaching um, ideas I guess more than, uh, more than problems ideas I think I mean the, you know a lot of the, the big commercial textbooks for you know I use 10 years have had you know, a page or somewhere about emoticons and right, abbreviations right. and those kind of things. But do you think that's the best way to learn in the classroom, or do you think that yeah. it could be done over over like I mean, a I, mean, I, I remember doing a, an activity. I used to do an activity quite, quite often with my outlearners, but it just like I just cut up you know hundreds of strips of paper <coughs> mm. and we just, and we just spend ten minutes writing messages to each other. Right, right. Um, and and practicing using those kind of things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I I think in in terms of this, what would be more useful than doing kind of that that kind of artif I don't know, artificial activity mm. would be showing them something like like I showed you guys, you mm -hmm. know, a, mm -hmm. an example of a real conversation, yeah. and then getting them to do their own kind of very rudimentary discourse analysis. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. looking at it, you That's know, give them some questions like how many conversations are happening here, mm -hmm. you know, how many topics are they talking about, yeah. how are they getting around problems of you know um, the lack of facial uh, feedback, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, what do you think about that? Well, obviously, that would be the starting point. That's good they do for it themselves. awareness raising. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and also, you mentioned like teaching of emoticons. Mm -hmm. How about teaching things like like these little sound things, like pff and he and lol. And, uh, I guess lol is quite a common one, but mm -hmm. but some of those more kind of just based on sounds that aren't quite as codified. Mm. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it, it's. Uh, I mean, what's great is that at this point, you probably don't have to teach too many of them mm. because. Because of Facebook, right? So probably most students maybe have one or two English-speaking friends or, or more. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I you know the the Korean ones, the the, the famous the Korean one is is J E J E, right? Which, is right. A, which means which is, la which is laughter. Some yeah. Koreans indicate laughter. Yeah. And some of the but you know I just saw my Korean friends using those, mm. and you kind of it, it's the the best way to learn them. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think it is good to teach those kind of sounds. Those mm. you know because they're, they're useful. Right, anyway, right, you know, and they are. There is a variety, obviously. Um, mm. Yeah, I think just use it by doing. I guess just actually get them doing it. And you can probably use call rooms to message yeah, yeah. to each other. That yeah, might yeah. be a good idea. That's it's still very kind of um, what's the word? Um, you know, you're still seeing what everybody's writing to each other. If you're if you're in charge of a call room, so you mm -hmm. can yeah. moderate it and control it and yeah. Kind of thing. What do you think about um, children having kind of the modern version of pen pals? They've got an IM pal that they can IM once a week. Yeah, it's tricky. I mean, obviously, the it works best with with friends, with people whose kind of communication style you you already know mm. quite well. I imagine if you were just you know suddenly start instant messaging with somebody who you didn't know at all, mm. I it would probably be easier in a way because you 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 wouldn't. You'd be less likely to step on each other's toes. You'd right. be more kind of more respectful, just like a, a nice message with a que and with a question. Yeah. Um. You you maybe wouldn't try be trying to replicate the type of communication you had with a friend face to face. Mm. Um. So yeah, that's not a bad idea actually. I think yeah. another issue that this throws up are like the kind of the audience, like who you're actually, or the register, like who you're actually speaking to, because mm. often the students might kind of message you occasionally. Yeah. And that might kind of. I guess flout the norms of how they should speak to their their teacher, right? For example, right, right. and that that because they've they've learned how to communicate with their friends and they don't yeah. Know how to, yeah so yeah. that could be another <clears throat> form of discourse for the learners, but that that often goes more into emails, like emailing like faculty staff, and I, I've I've talked about that before. Yeah, other, yeah, other places. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that there are a lot of issues here. Um, I think very often, e even though, as you said, textbooks do have like a chapter on emoticons, or they, you know, they have certain um, areas where you can focus on this kind of communication. I think it is still 
a little bit overlooked sometimes and some of the specific challenges mm -hmm. are not addressed that much unless teachers make a special effort to address them yeah. um, but I think there are specific issues that could be dealt with in the classroom mm -hmm. um, and yeah I think we've looked at some of the some of the ways that could be done today um, so that's today's TEFL culture all about computer all about computer mediated communication or CMC TEFL pioneers this episode's TEFL pioneer is a man called Joseph Wright, mm -hmm. FBA. Okay, not FBI. No. Okay. FBA. FBA. What is that? FBA. I'm not sure what that means, to be honest. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, <laughs> he was born uh, in 1855 mm -hmm. um, in Yorkshire uh, and died uh, February 1930. Okay. Um, so he's an English, he's a, a famous English philologist. Okay. So mm -hmm. he. he basically interested in studying the, the written word and mm -hmm. the history of the written word in English. Um, so he, he had, I think he had a kind of interesting life. Um, we'll get to maybe his influence, um, as tenuous as it may be, on the world of Duffel <laughs> okay. a bit later, but just a bit of his background. So as, as I said, he was born, he was born in a, a town called Idle near Bradford in oh, Yorkshire. Nice. I've only taken the train through Yorkshire. Mm. I've, I've actually fully been in it. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. How was it? It was all right. Okay. Yeah. Never even thought about Yorkshire. <laughs> uh, he was the second son of a man named Dufton Wright. Okay. A lot of good names coming up. Dufton. Yeah. Uh, who was a woolen cloth weaver and quarryman. A wool weaver. A woolen cloth <laughs> weaver. <laughs> uh, a woolen cloth weaver. Right. And Joseph Wright, his mother was Sarah Ann, which is a normal name. Yeah. Um, but he, he held a series of... of an, Maybe usual jobs at the time, the jobs that which might sound a little unusual to us uh -huh. uh, in his early childhood. At the <laughs> at the age of six, he was a donkey boy <laughs> in, in a quarry, presumably the same quarry where his father worked. Right, right. Um, basically, what's a donkey boy? So he just carry pull along donkeys. Or yeah, yeah. They lead the donkeys. He lead a, a, a donkey drawn cart. Donkeys. Sorry. They used as donkeys. He's half <laughs> half donkey, half boy. Right. Yeah. right. No, he he would lead a donkey drawn cart um, around the quarry. Right. Um, he later, well, I guess once he retired from being a donkey boy, he became a bobbin doffer. Okay. <laughs> you know what a bobbin doffer does? Uh, <laughs> Dobbs boffins. Doffer? Dobbs, <laughs> Dobbs, Dobbs means boffins. take off something. <laughs> that's doff, right. Doff your hat. So you doffed bobbins. Yeah, that's right. What's a bobbin? What's a bobbin? Uh, <laughs> when, when you're um, doing some kind of weaving. Oh, that, right, right. Yeah. Okay. So he took off the bobbins. So the bobbins would, would fill up, you know, from the spool, mm -hmm. and he would take them off and put empty ones on. Yeah. Oh, okay. I see can that. you doff anything else? You can doff your hat. You can doff a bobbin, clearly. You can doff a cap. I'd, I'd say a cap. No, a cap. Any hat. Oh, okay. Doff yeah. a uh, bottle cap. Just cause a bottle got, cap. Just because we've got a bottle in front of us. Yeah. Could, uh, I don't know if I'd... You, you'd un... Uh, maybe. Unscrew. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. If it was a job. <laughs> uh, and then later on, he was a wool sorter. Okay. Yeah. Again, probably, you know, the family business. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but he, yeah, he, so he worked in a, in a small Yorkshire town. He said he didn't learn uh, to, he was unable to read a newspaper until he was 15 years old. Okay. Um, uh, so he, he was a kind of late, I don't maybe normal for the time and period, but he, he was, he came to, to language late, the mm. written language late. Yeah. Um, but once he found it, he, he became very enthusiastic about it. Mm. One of the actors from Alien did that as well. He taught himself to read by reading scripts for films that he was applying for. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Which one? I can't remember. I'll tell you later. <laughs> okay. Is it libelous if we say the actor? No. 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 Okay. What's he going to do? I don't fear him. <laughs> Is he going to impregnate us with a chest first? <laughs> so he became uh, fascinated with languages. Um, he began start, uh, going to night school to learn different languages, French, German, and Latin. Um, and then when he was 18, he started his own night school, actually mm. teaching colleagues languages. Right. Oh, so he's a very fast learner. By 1876, he had saved up the 40 pounds that you would need to afford a term study at the University of Heidelberg. Mm -hmm. um, although he, he decided to walk there from Antwerp to save right. some money. How far is that? Uh, Antwerp to Heidelberg? Mm. I don't know. 500 kilometers? Okay. I have no idea. That's not bad. No, it's not bad. <laughs> uh, but after that, he went back to Yorkshire, um, continued his studies um, while working as a schoolmaster. Mm -hmm. He was one of these people, one of his former pupils said that um, this is the quote, with a piece of chalk, uh, he would draw illustrative diagrams at the same time with each hand. And oh. Chalk was doing it. So he'd have a piece of chalk in each hand drawing diagrams. Two different diagrams or two parallel diagrams? I wonder, yeah. Because I could do that. 
All right. Probably but two different one diagrams. drawing here in the air. The only, the only other person I've heard of do that is Da Vinci, who would, who would be writing two different things in different languages at the same time. Mm. One, one, one with each hand. Future pioneer. Da Vinci. Da Vinci. <laughs> Possibly, yeah. Perhaps. Yeah. Um, and then he later, he returned to Heidelberg later, and in 1885 completed his PhD there. On, his PhD was on qualitative and quantitative changes of the Indo-Germanic vowel system in Greek. Oh. Yeah. I'm sure it's a great read. Like yeah. A, yeah. Is it still available online? <laughs> Perhaps. Uh, so he returned from Germany, and he was offered a post at Oxford, mm -hmm. uh, and became a lecturer there. To, he was a lecturer in the Association for the Higher Education of Women, okay, um, and deputy lecturer in German at the Taylor Institution, which is the, the big library there. Right. Um, and so basically, he, he held uh, very high positions at Oxford University for a lot of his life. He specialized in the Germanic languages, and wrote uh, grammars of, of Old English, Middle English, Old High German, Middle High German. Mm. I'm sure Claire Cramps has read all of these. <laughs> um, and, but apparently some of these are still, uh, still well, they, they were being reprinted for a long time yeah. after his death. Still on the bestseller list. Still on the bestseller list. Um, but his, his other interest, strong interest, was in uh, English dialects. Mm. Um, and he wrote uh, 1892 book called A Grammar of the Dialect of Windhill. Which right. I assume is a town in Yorkshire. Yeah, it's just a hill. All right, people live on it. Okay, um, but he claimed it was the first grammar of its kind, so a, a grammar of a specific dialect. Mm. Um, and I, I'm sure we've all seen those, or you know, read those things about how just the the, the huge variety of dialects mm. um, in England. Yes. Um, and so he 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 was interested in focusing, and, and not just vocabulary, but also grammar. Mm. Um, and then he also. Uh, edited uh, a six-volume English dialect dictionary, right. mm -hmm. um, initially at his own expense. Um, so he put together this huge, huge dictionary of, of different dialects. Um, and it's a... I don't know what to say that. <laughs> what happened to it? It's a good dictionary. It's a really good book. <laughs> the hands are the best of us. Yeah. Worry. So it, it was... <laughs> So the, the English uh, dialect dictionary, it was this, this massive undertaking. Unsu for some strange reason, once it was finished, he stopped it. There was a kind of special society put together at Oxford to put it together. Mm. And once it was finished, they just, they, they shut it down. And okay. you'd think it would be a kind of an ongoing thing. Yeah, well, on the understanding that languages never change. <laughs> right, yeah, it's kind of odd. You'd think, yeah, you'd think he'd be able to update it, or it'd be mm. great if it was still going, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, dialects would drop out, and I'm, sh I'm sure a lot would die out, I, I assume. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the other thing that he's uh, famous for creating is something called the dialect test, mm. um, which I, I'm not sure if he used it as <coughs> part of uh, compiling the, the English dialect dictionary, um, but it's basically a, a short text which he would give people to read, um, and by listening to the vowels, specifically the vowels they produce, but I think a lot of different phonemes, mm. he would try to figure out where they're from. Right. So, I thought you guys would, uh, would mind taking the dialect test. Oh, All right. I don't think yeah. either of you have revealed exactly... Is this a test to which dialect we have? Yes. Or are you testing how good our dialect is of, oh, there's, of, there's, of a particular no, dialect? No, no, there's no value judgment. <laughs> okay. it's right. No, no, no. You're, you're going to read this in your own accent. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and I don't, I don't think anybody knows where in the British Isles you're from. Well, I'm from can, Windy Hill. <laughs> guess, to be honest, by the way I say my... Well, no, but that, that could cover a, a wide swath of yeah. the southern. I could just be a speech impediment. <laughs> <laughs> um, so are, okay. are we going to go sequentially, like question At one, the same one, time, I thought. No, no, no. <laughs> okay, actually, that's a good idea. So it's divided into seven kind of parts. Mm. Some of the parts, for example, part three and... Some of, some of them are just one sentence, but part three and four mm. comprises one whole sentence. Mm. Right. Okay. I think that's a good idea. You, you take them, you, do, you so, each do one. All right. All right, so I'll do, I'll do it too. Okay. All right, so, so we're going to start with, it'll be Rob, then Matt, yeah. and then Matthew. Okay, number one. All right. So I say, mates, you see now that I'm right about that little girl coming from the school yonder. So I see, mates, you see now that I'm right about that little girl coming from the school yonder. So I say, mates, you see now that I'm right about that little girl coming from the school yonder. Okay. Yeah. And any no differences that you noticed? Um, I used a glottal stop somewhere. Yeah, I think we all did though. Mm. Maybe in different places. I used a better one than you. Yeah, actually, I don't think I did use one. Do you, do you remember where yours was? Uh, right about, I think. Right yeah. about. Right about, and yours that was li little. And, and little. Oh, I used right. both. You little, both did little, I, th I yeah. think. 
Yeah. What about the last word? What, how do you say the last word? Yon, I, yonder yeah, with the I, schwa. Yonder. Yeah. But I sort of stopped before I said it. I, right, it's you, an unusual you word. It quite naturally, as if you usually say that. Coming from the school yonder. <laughs> I, I do. Yeah. I thought I thought your your first your first vowel sound was slightly different between yonder. the two of you. Yonder. Yonder. Mm. 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 Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's try number so two. Who, who won? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Number two. Yeah, it's it's you two, and then it's me as the neutral accent. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> the correct way. Of the correct way. Uh, she's going down the road there through the red gate on the left hand side of the way. Okay, she's going down the road there through the red gate on the left hand side of the way. Don't pronounce your properly <laughs> now. <laughs> yeah, this should be as natural as possible. <laughs> she's going down the road there through the red gate on the left hand side of the way. Yeah, it's hard to do it naturally, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I didn't I'm, I'm emphasizing my uh, my accent yeah, I had when yeah, I was younger. I that, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I I was I was imagining by the end it like it would come yeah. out more fully. Okay. <laughs> Should we do one more? Okay, let's do one more. Well, all right. Uh, sure enough, the child has gone straight up to the door of the wrong house. Sure enough, the child has gone straight up to the door of the wrong house. Hmm. Sure enough, the child has gone straight up to the door of the wrong house. See, I I, I did the oh, of the wrong of the wrong house. Of the wrong. Of the I wrong just did like a little schwa there, like of the wrong house. Okay. Sure enough. I think I went up on the enough. I, mm. and then you, I think you kind of, sure enough. Okay. Yeah. For me, the, the interesting one was the word right, The word after straight. Straight up. Straight up. Straight up. Straight up. I don't know how I said it. Yeah. Straight up. 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 I don't have a sound in between. I, I had a little stop at the end there. Straight, straight up. Not, uh, I'm, not, I'm not thinking about the, the connection. Just just the up. The vowel sound. In your straight up. Up. Straight up. Up. That. <laughs> right. Charles has gone straight up to the door of the wrong house. Right. I mean, but that everybody has a different one of those. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. The point. Yeah. Where, yeah. So, what did this test aim to find out? Yeah. Where Where am I from? <laughs> <laughs> um, I've forgotten. So, so basically, he would he would give it. So, it's it's designed so it covers all the different mm. vowel sounds and diphthongs, etc. Yeah. So it's it's not it's not necessarily identifying where somebody comes from. It's finding somebody typical of a dialect, having them read it, yeah, and then uh, deciding, okay, this dialect, they use this sound for this word, right, et cetera, right. et cetera. Yep. It's interesting, so I, I taught uh, last semester, um, I taught a course on British English dialects to my students, okay. and we actually did this kind of thing, just contrastive sentences in different dialects, mm. and got them doing transcriptions and stuff, and for them it was really interesting to see the, uh, you know, the, the contrast, both in the pronunciation, but also in the vocabulary used in the different dialects in the UK, because ah, right, right. they had no idea. They thought everyone just spoke like like me, because yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, I'm the only the exposure they've had. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, so just just gonna finish off a bit of his personal life. Just, mm -hmm. uh, so in 1896, he married Elizabeth Mary Lee, um, okay. who actually was co his co-author with some of his English grammars. Right. So Joseph and his wife had two children. They were called Willie Boy and Mary. Okay. Okay. It's good. It's um, good names. Both yeah. died in child. Hood, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, childhood. Childhood. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, it's a shame. Yeah. But uh, Wright and his wife, they were known for their hospitality, uh, They would for their students especially, to have the students come over, uh, serve them tea, um, and he had a party trick involving his Aberdeen Terrier, Jack, okay, uh, who would lick his lips when <laughs> Wright... Would lick his lips. Yeah, I know, like, right. Now that I read it, I'm not sure if it, it licked his own lips, yeah. Jack licked his own lips, or licked uh, Joseph's lips. Could have been, because he did this... He would lick his lips when Wright said the Gothic words for fig tree. Okay. <laughs> which, as we all know, are smaka bagmus. Of course. All right. Smaka bagmus. Hmm. Smaka bagmus. It's not like smack your lips. Like. <laughs> all right. So his dog would lick. It's, it's unclear. His own lips. Yeah, hopefully, but we, yeah. we're not sure. Right. We're not sure. Uh, so he was a progressive uh, in terms of uh, women in education, mm -hmm. um, although he wasn't progressive enough that he thought they should vote. Right. Um, as, even within the university, mm. uh, his quote was that they were less independent in judgment than men and apt to run in a body like sheep. Okay. Yeah. He did have a lot of experience with sheep, but yeah. I think he's off the mark there. Yeah. 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 I, well, I agree. Being the progressive I am, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I, know, I agree with you. Not right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he died of pneumonia in 1930, as I mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, his last word was dictionary, apparently, which is <laughs> some rubbish. Yeah. Last dictionary. word. Dictionary. Which he might have been, you know, watch out for that following dictionary or yeah. ask me the dictionary. <laughs> ask me the yeah, okay. yeah. Um, 
he, he, he did have some influence on um, culture, though. Mm -hmm. uh, he was apparently an important early influence on J.R.R. Tolkien. Okay. Uh, he was one of his tutors at Oxford. Mm -hmm. uh, he corresponded regularly with Thomas Hardy while he was editing the dictionary. Right. I'm not sure whether he was giving uh, information data to Hardy to use in his books or the other way around. Right. Uh, and he was also greatly admired by Virginia Woolf, oh. um, who, who wrote to him and of him. Okay, nice. So that's uh, this episode's TEFL pioneer, Joseph Wright. FPA. TEFL News. Okay, so for this week's TEFL News, I'd like to talk about an, an article that was published in a recent Oxford ELT journal mm -hmm. by Steve Walsh and Steve Mann. The title of the article is Doing Reflective Practice, a Data-Led Way Forward. Okay. Now, when I first saw this title, I'm very interested in reflective practice, but data and reflection, I, for me, doesn't really sit together well. Okay. How about for you? Well, for me, it depends what they mean by data. I think your, your own personal experience is data, and anything you can collect from the classroom to reflect on is data. Mm. But if they mean data as in a big broad set of stuff, then, yeah, it's a different meaning of data. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I suppose you might, as part of your reflective practice, you might you know, go to uh, articles or books and, and look at some data, some previous research, to kind mm. of inform how you're going to move forward with it. Yeah. Yeah, they're, I mean, they're talking more, they talk in the article about not the big R of research. Right. They mean like um, localized data, very specific data, mm. as opposed mm. to, like Rob said, like big data sets, which we're right. talking mm. about. Um, they have a few guiding principles of what they think reflective practice is. Obviously, mm -hmm. one of those coming from Dewey, who is well known for for reflective practice yeah. in, in the, the sole method of escape from the purely impulsive or purely routine action. Mm -hmm. I think we can all agree that's why we reflect on what we actually do. Mm -hmm. And another quote from Bode, Keo, and Walker, um, reflection is a generic term for those intellectual and eff effective activities in which individuals engage to explore their experiences in order to lead to new understandings and appreciation. Mm -hmm. Now what the two writers say here is that there needs to be more kind of concrete descriptions of reflective practice and that show how we are actually getting things done as mm -hmm. teachers and educators. And they feel that things are limited at the moment, Okay. which I'm going to talk about, mm -hmm. basically. Uh, they feel that um, there should be more of an emphasis on data in helping to make reflective practice more concrete so that we can see how reflection is done in practice. Mm -hmm. um, reflective tools that produce data that might act as evidence for practitioner reflection so they have this big kind of um, belief about evidence based data <coughs> in reflection right. um, and they highlight four problems that currently um, reflective practice is insufficiently data led mm -hmm. that it's heavily focused on the individual at the expense of collaborative options right and it's dominated by written forms of reflection. Mm. And also it's lacking in detail about the nature and purposes of reflective tools. Right. Okay. Tools being, you know, like checklists or observation models, th those kinds of tools. So we'll, we'll, we'll unpack this a little bit. Um, so first of all, what's your experiences of reflective practice? Um, I've had experiences of formal kind of reflection uh, where I've been videoed or observed uh, and then sort of sat with uh, a higher up and um, and chewed out <laughs> kind of things happen. <laughs> okay. um, but also, uh, yeah, more more personal reflective practice, um, as in not not exactly keeping a teaching journal, but going like after the class, going and just speaking to other teachers and, and just sort of going through what happened in my lesson, where things went wrong, and, mm -hmm. and so on. Um, yeah, so I've, I've had a little bit of experience of both, mm. but perhaps not not so systematized. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've done some like action research cycles, I guess, um, which I've, I've actually I've done two different types. Kind of one, um, maybe on a bigger scale. So you know, it starts with identifying an issue in your classroom, and it could be something very small. So I, I've done that, yeah, and just trying out different things to see what works, and and going off and reading reading literature to to kind of help inform my decisions. Okay, so that... and also bigger bigger things. Um, Kind of assessing how well the, the 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 entire design of the course is going. Okay, so they um so the first 
point you mentioned was very individual. Mm-hmm. That was something you were doing yourself. Mm. And they kind of, they don't call this a problem so much, but they kind of say that it needs to be more collaborative, mm. which I don't always think is the case. I don't fully yeah. agree with that. I think it can be very introspective. Yep. Yeah. Uh-huh. But they kind of say that it should be more collaborative. Mm. Above all. Um, right. and again, this for me kind of doesn't really sit well because I think being reflective should be about yourself, but you should also be looking out at what others are doing around you, obviously, yeah. and this is really important mm. and obvious, I guess. Right. Um, the next point is that it's dominated by written forms of reflection. Obviously, um, when you're doing kind of um, pre-surface teaching, like Selters or Cert Tessels, yeah. or maybe not so much, maybe Deltas mm. more so, you have to actually reflect on the lesson you've just taught and you have to write it up. And they often believe that this leads to faking it, that you're kind of just mm-hmm. writing what yeah. what will pass this particular assignment and it's mm-hmm. kind of fake reflection. And this mm-hmm. is something we talked about with Thomas Farrell. Yeah. Yeah. I think I mean and, and you know, and anything that you're forced to do basically is part of a course. Um, mm-hmm. it's gonna lose some authenticity. Yeah. Um, as part of my distance the, the distance component of my MA course was, you know, commenting on other people's Moodle posts and stuff and having mm-hmm. a, you know a uh, a set number of comments you have to make, and some, you know, some, you're, you're you're writing because you have to for your course, and right. it's not very meaningful. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and I think the same thing applies here. Yeah, or so can they, apply. Yeah, they they believe that rather than simply recipe following, they believe that it should be slightly more graded, mm, mm. and sh- and it shouldn't just be purely written. You know, mm-hmm. it should be collaborative, right. and they call one of the things they call for later on is dialogic reflective practice, which we'll come on to. Um, reflective practice lacks appropriate tools. And by tools, I wasn't quite sure what tools meant at first. I thought they were meant kind of like corpus analysis based kind of tools, you know, where you actually uh, transcribe your classes. Yeah. But they're they're talking particularly about um, kind of one size fits all like um, task check sheets. There's often these check sheets that have been made for teachers. Are they doing this? Are they doing this? Mm. And obviously we have those in localized settings as well, but there's a lot of one size fits all that, are often applied and mm-hmm. they're usually influenced by methodology mm, right like how communicative is, is this classroom um, how much L1 is being used yeah that sort of <coughs> thing finally they also believe that reflective practice is insufficiently data led and they quote Farrell's book for example which includes a chapter on collaborative teacher development but they don't have any data extracts right they don't have any Kind of um, in the book, you mean? In the book, yeah, they don't have any interviews or transcripts of mm. broken reflections or self reports. Right. He just kind of talks about it without any of this. Mm. Yep. So this is, yeah, these are some of the problems that they wish to address in this article. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what are your overall thoughts so far? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, you know, one of the good things about reflective practice is that it's not trying to provide generalizable results. Um, it is very much, uh, I think, I mean, they, they say focuses on the individual and that and that the indivi- individual could get more out of maybe collaborating or discussing what they're doing with somebody else, which, which, I, which is true. Hmm. But to me, like, the, the purpose of it is ultimately to, to, for an individual to improve uh, what they're hmm. doing, an aspect of what they're doing. Yeah, I, and I think it should be very flexible. I don't think they, they I don't think they're saying that it, it's still about the individual, but they're saying mm-hmm. that it should be the process of reflection should involve more than one individual. Yeah, no, I agree. But I, even that, I think it, it, it should be up. I think it can. I, I'm not sure about saying it should. I think mm. that, you know, that should yeah. be one of the options available. Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So they call for three types of research or three types of data, and they, they want to emphasize not a big R to research, the small R of research, uh, small scale, localized, context specific data and they call for three types they call for data-led reflective practice Mm -hmm. Um, so more extracts more extracts of interviews extracts of classrooms that kind of thing okay Um, dialogic reflective practice Um, Mm -hmm. for example not just written reflective practice actually having a speaker and an understander right and having kind of a that kind of cooperative environment Mm -hmm. yeah uh, by understander, the understander reflects back to the speaker what they consider to be the main issues. Mm-hmm. And the advantage of this approach is that the speaker gets a chance to listen and adjust their comments based on the feedback they receive from the understander. 
So even I think this is still using written reflection, right? But you kind of get have the chance to kind of edit it mm. and have a second pair of eyes on it as well. Yeah, yeah. Again, this is still written, so this is kind of problematic. And then the last one is thinking about appropriate tools. And some of the tools they talk about is stimulated recall. Mm. Are you familiar mm. with that term? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay. One one example is videoing it. Yeah, right, right. And then reflecting back on, on the video itself and yeah. collecting data from that video. Right. So it extracts uh, maybe wait time, mm. type of questions that were used. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. the, actually using the that stimulated data. recall itself, though, would just be watching something and then commenting on, you know. So the actual action itself. Is, yeah. Uh, I mean, that's my understanding of the stimulated recall is that you, it, the, the, the stimulation of, of watching the video is going to help you recall or help you reflect, I guess, mm -hmm. look at, you, you try to figure out, you know, what was, why did I do that? What was my thing behind it? What are the students getting out of it? Yeah. Et yeah. And they also, finally, they also call for ad hoc <coughs> self observation. Mm. So not using observation uh, models from well, kind of well published books, like for example, Woof, uh, Woof, sorry, Roof Wine Rups mm. observation tools. Uh -huh. Very good book, very well respected. I've used it a lot, but it might be a one size fits all book. Right. So they're calling for more kind of localized models to be used. Yeah. In that sense. Mm. And yeah, so ad hoc observation, making use of videos as opposed to having someone in the room. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, there's not, this isn't so much a new section, but this was an article that was published recently. But I think um, it interested me because I like reflective practice, but I'm not sure if it needs data necessarily right. but I do agree that there, there does need to be something there that shows what improvements are being made yeah well I mean data again is the, the word data is slippery like when we yeah. went to Thomas Farrell's presentation <clears throat> sorry he, he did give the example of uh, a teacher who was just directing questions to you know one student or two students in yeah. the class yeah. um, and he sat at the back of the room and just counted how many questions uh, you know to and from each student was asked and then put it together, and that is data. I mean, that's, that's solid, data, yeah. qualitative, quantitative data, yeah. um, which uh, which they, the teacher could then use to to figure out something that they hadn't noticed during the actual classroom time. Mm. Um, and I mean, that kind of data, I think, is 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 fine as well. I don't I don't mm. think that that needs to be. It, it's not necessarily generalizable out, but other people could take that model sure. and do the same thing and figure out a similar kind of uh, points. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's what they're kind of saying as well. Okay. Yeah, so that's today's Tefl news. Not not really news. I mean, as we've kind of shown, but um, yeah, reflective practice, a data-led way forward. And if you want to find that article, it's in the ELT Journal, and it's by Steve Walsh and Steve Mann. Okay. So thank you very much for listening today. If you'd like to get in contact with us, you can send an email to tefalology at gmail.com or you can follow us on Twitter at tefalology. Also, if you have the time, uh, we'd really appreciate it if you could write a review or leave a rating on iTunes, a five-star rating preferably, we'd settle for four, um, or just tell your friends about the podcast. Uh, so, it's goodbye from me. Goodbye. Goodbye. Two children, Willy Boy. <laughs> Willy Boy. <laughs> That's the boy's name. Willy Boy. Donkey, donkey boy. boy and Willy Boy. <laughs> donkey Willy. Boy. He was gonna call him Donkey Boy, but Elizabeth Mary said so can't do that. So they had two children, a boy and a girl. <laughs> what, what, what perchance were their names? <laughs> so there's Willy Boy and Mary. Yeah. Um, yeah. The sad thing, both of them died in childhood. <laughs> Got to do this again. Do this again. <laughs> okay. All right. I knew that was going to get us. So, Joseph and Mary. Uh, Joseph and Mary. <laughs> <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, his name is Joseph. Why did I think So, Wright and his wife, uh, they were known for their hospitality to their students. They would often invite them to their homes. Um,
for Yorkshire Sunday tea, okay, which I'm sure is delicious. Um, he was known for <laughs> he had a party trick, right? Um, <laughs> as as we all do. As we all do. <laughs> uh, but his his party trick, you know. <laughs> Involve bobbins. Have a donkey behind the curtain. <laughs> yeah. yeah, an Aberdeen terrier. What? An Aberdeen terrier. Jack. Okay. 